Well, good morning to you all. I'm going to ask you to turn to a book you often don't turn to, to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is the second to the last book in your Old Testament. It's right before Malachi, and Malachi is right before the Gospel of Matthew. So turn there with me this morning. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a privilege to be able to speak to you and study the Word of God with you. And I pray that when we leave today, we'll consider ourselves blessed for having been here, for having studied together and worshiped together, but most importantly, to have been reminded of the Lord's death and what it means for us. Thank you, Wes, for those good words this morning. In Zechariah chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says this, Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. You know, his name is not a name that you hear, you hear often in Scripture. We don't talk about him a lot. We don't talk about him in Bible class a lot or in sermons hardly ever. But he was gifted one of the hardest jobs that anybody was ever given in the Bible. His name is Zerubbabel. And it's really fun to say, so I don't know why we don't say it more. In the year 538 B.C., King Cyrus of Persia issues a decree which frees all the Jews from captivity. And so for 70 years, they've been held prisoner, and now they're free to finally go home and rebuild their city. Zerubbabel was the man chosen by God to lead the first group back. And he led that first group back with a specific mission in mind. God gave him a specific task. I want you to lead these people back so that they can rebuild my temple. That's the job. Before you do anything else, when you're restoring my city... I want you to rebuild my temple, the center of sacrifice and service and worship. I want you to make sure you get that in place. Zerubbabel, that's your job. Get to it. And he had his work cut out for him, to say the least. Imagine being the first one on the scene after 70 years. Coming into a destroyed temple, rubble all over the place. Algae and mold growing on the old stones. You've got to start from scratch. Add to that the fact that the people he brought with him kind of got their priorities skewed once they got there. In Haggai chapter 1, we read about that, where the prophet says this, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, consider your ways. The people he brought back said, hey, instead of building the temple first, let's build us some nice houses and then we'll get going on the temple. They got distracted. And maybe even more difficult than that, it's once they got their priorities straightened out and they finally started getting this temple built, they got discouraged. Haggai writes about that too. Haggai 2 and verse 3, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? The previous temple was the temple of Solomon, which if you ever read uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, you read about the construction of that temple, you understand just how majestic and amazing the temple that Solomon built was. And some of the people who had come back, they were there before Jerusalem got destroyed. And they had seen the previous temple in all of its glory. And now they look at the temple they're building and they're like, Really? This looks like a pile of sticks. It's nothing compared to what was here before. It's a mediocre, lame temple. And so he, here's Zerubbabel leading this wandering, sad, dramatic rabble. And all they've been able to build is this mediocre temple. You know, the prophet Isaiah promised that there would be a glorious future for God's people after their captivity. 
He told them that in Isaiah chapter 62. He said, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness on all kings, your glory, and you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. You also will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. That's the future Isaiah promises to God's people. That's the future of Jerusalem. The future where they are a bright shining torch to the rest of the nations. But it's hard to see that future now. When all they're looking at is this depressing building. In the minds of Zerubbabel and the people, what they've done is just a small thing. They haven't made much of a difference. They haven't had nearly as much of an impact as they would have hoped. At least that's the way it seems to them. They look at their work and they say, this is a, this is a small thing. And I think on that count, we can commiserate with Zerubbabel and the people. Because if you're like me, then you feel the same way at some times. Do you ever feel like the way that you contribute to the kingdom is small and insignificant? Like the difference in the impact you make doesn't really matter that much at all? You ever feel like you're not making that much of a difference in this world? I think that's true, and I think we feel that in a million different ways. Maybe you're a parent, right? And you're doing everything you can to raise your kids to be godly, to know the Bible, and to, to, to grow up to be like Jesus, and to want to be like Jesus. And, and you just think to yourself, am, am I getting through it all? Are they listening to me? Is this sinking in? Do they know anything about their Bible? Are they listening? Are they paying attention? Do they care? Or maybe you're an employee, and you're at, the, you're at the job site, and you're trying to shine your light. You're trying to have a good attitude. You're trying to act like Christ, because you know what kind of benefits the Bible promises are going to come down the way in terms of evangelism and everything like that, if you shine your light and have a good attitude. But you just sit there, and you're like, does anyone pay attention to me? Does anyone see what I'm doing? I didn't complain for like 13 days, and nobody noticed. Am I making a difference at all? Maybe you're trying to spread the gospel trying to find someone to teach, someone to save, someone to show the gospel to, someone to share the good news with, and you look at the city and you're like, how in the world am I going to do that? There are so many lost people here. How am I ever going to make a difference at all in any of their lives? You know, sometimes we feel like what we do for the kingdom is small, insignificant, and of little importance. And for that reason, I think that's why the Holy Spirit allows us to read Zerubbabel's mail. Because in the book of Zechariah, the prophet receives a message that is intended specifically for Zerubbabel. He is called out by name. This is his special message from God. And that message is summed up well by what we read in verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. That's the message of the vision. Don't despise the small contributions you make to the work of God. Don't despise the small things. Because they matter far more than you think they do. Now, that point is made through an admittedly complicated vision. So I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. So when you read it and you're like, I don't get what's going on here, don't worry. It is complicated. It is perplexing. In fact, when Zechariah hears it himself, the angel says, do you know what these things mean? And he says, no, I don't got a clue. So don't feel bad if you don't know what's happening. But we'll read it and then we'll talk about what we think it means. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 1. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me, as a man who is awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see. And behold, a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on top of it. And it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it. One on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, what are these, my Lord? And so the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And so, there's this vision that Zerubbabel is meant to receive. 
That's meant to encourage him and inspire him in the work that he's doing. In this vision, I think we can see there are three elements. There are three things that he sees in this vision. He sees, first of all, two olive trees. He sees one large lamp, and he sees seven small lamps. And the other significant part of that is that all of these things are connected to one another, right? You'll see in the vision, he talks about the spouts going from one to the other. And so the idea is that something flows from the olive trees to the large lamp, to the seven small lamps. It's backward on my screen, so I guess I should have gone this way. But you get it. From the olive trees to the large lamp to the seven small lamps. And so that's the idea. These olive trees are producing oil, and that oil flows to the large lamp, which enables it to stay lit and to burn. But the oil that goes to the large lamp also flows to the seven small lamps and helps them burn too. And so that's the picture that we have. Olive trees fueling a large lamp and the large lamp fueling the small lamps. Now that's clear enough, I think. But the question after that is, what in the world do these things symbolize? What is, what is meant by these symbols? Now if you look in the middle there, I think it's pretty clear and pretty obvious that the large lamp is the city of Jerusalem. If you'll remember, as we read in Isaiah earlier, the Old Testament commonly refers to Jerusalem as a source of light, right? You'll remember Isaiah talked about it like it is a, a burning torch, right? For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. That's common language in the Old Testament, that Jerusalem is a light to the nations. It is a shining light. It's the it's the epicenter of salvation and hope and eternal life. And so it makes sense that Jerusalem would be the large lamp. And then it follows that the seven small lamps would be the all the nations, right? That's what Isaiah talks about. Jerusalem's going to be that large lamp that's shining brightly, and the nations are going to walk by its light. They are going to be drawn to the salvation and the hope that is found in Jerusalem because that's where Jesus died. And so I think that's pretty obvious, that Jerusalem becomes a light that sustains and nourishes and gives hope to all the other nations. But the question that's left is, who are the two olive trees? In verse 14, we get kind of an answer to that. In Zechariah 4 and verse 14, it says, Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. That word anointed means chosen. It means somebody has been picked or chosen for a special job. And I think the most fitting explanation for those two olive trees, those two anointed ones, would be Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor. Because there are two men who are in Jerusalem at this time who have been specifically chosen by God to do this special mission. Joshua has been chosen as the high priest. It's his job to take care of the spiritual state of the people. Zerubbabel has been chosen by God as the governor to make sure he takes care of the temple and sees that it's rebuilt. And so now that we see what all of these things are meant to symbolize, I think the point starts to become very clear, doesn't it? Z Jerusalem can't bless the nations. Until Zerubbabel has blessed Jerusalem. The idea of this vision is that Zerubbabel is doing something that is important. Something that's going to make an impact. Something that is going to matter along down the line. He may think that what he's doing is small or insignificant. He may think the temple he built is really lame. But the point of the vision is what you're doing matters. And what you're doing is going to make a difference in the future. More than you can possibly realize. Because you're going to be rebuild Jerusalem. And because you rebuild Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to be able to be a light to the nations. And so again, what we're told in verse 10 is don't despise. Don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise the small contributions that you make. The message of the vision is that small contributions are not to be looked down upon. They're not to be despised because they are vital. Don't look down on the small things that you do. 
because you never know what they're going to end up doing in the future. You never know what kind of impact they're going to have. That's a lesson that Zerubbabel needed to hear. And again, I think it's a message that we need to hear as well, don't we? Because sometimes that's exactly what we do. We despise the small contributions that we make to the kingdom. We look down upon the things that we do. We think that we're not making any difference at all. And we're not having any impact. We look at all the work that needs to be done and all the things that might be done and all the things that are wrong with the world and all the things that are wrong with the church and all the things that are going sideways and we get overwhelmed by it all and we think that what we're doing doesn't really matter. The vision of Zerubbabel teaches us don't despise the small things. There are three lessons that I think we can draw out of that. Three lessons I want to point out to you and then the lesson will be yours. I think the first thing that we learn from this vision, from this story, is that we should not despise the small things because the small things really do matter. The small things really do matter. The small things that we do really are bigger than we think they are. They really matter more than we think they do. You know, it's kind of funny to me. I don't know if it's funny to you, but it's funny to me to see Zerubbabel struggle in the way that he does. Because I'm looking at Zerubbabel and I'm thinking, that's a pretty important guy, right? Right? He is chosen by God to be the first person back to Jerusalem to build the temple. Like, that's a pretty big thing. Not everybody gets asked to do that. That's not somebody just doing some random thing. That's a pretty big thing. And so I don't care how mediocre the temple looks. He's doing something big, at least in, in my eyes. But I also understand where he's coming from. Because people, unless they're raving narcissists, tend to downplay their accomplishments, don't they? We tend to look at the things that we do and say, ah, oh, you know, it's really not that, not that big of a deal. It's not really that important. You know, I call that the good cook effect. Have you ever been to somebody's house and they make this awesome meal for you? Everything is perfect. Everything is wonderful. You eat like, you eat like everything that they have on your plate. You get, you get seconds and thirds. You eat too much like they were hoping for leftovers, but too bad you were there because it was just so good. And then you're sitting there and you're like, hey man, this food was wonderful. And then all they can do is criticize their meal. Have you ever been there? That's what every good cook does. I don't know why they do it, but that's what they do. They downplay their accomplishments. Oh, you know, this wasn't right. This wasn't right. I want to be like, no, it was awesome. It was really good food. We downplay our accomplishments. And that's what Zerubbabel is doing. This temple wasn't as grand as the previous temple, but it still mattered. It was still a huge thing that he was doing for God. He may have thought that it was small and insignificant, but it wasn't small and insignificant in the eyes of God. It wasn't small in its effect on the future. I wonder if sometimes we look at the things that we do. We look at the temples we're building. And we think they're smaller than they really are. Is there anything that God has called us to do in our walk that we look at and we say, that's really a small thing. That's really, that really doesn't make that much of a difference. That really doesn't matter very much. I think sometimes we do that with our example, right? I'm going to go out. I'm going to live. I'm going to be a good example. I'm going to do the right things. I'm going to have a good attitude. I'm going to be positive, positive and joyful. But you know what? It doesn't really make that much of a difference. What matters is whether or not I'm righteous or whether or not I'm wicked. What matters is whether or not I open up the Bible and show somebody the Bible. My example doesn't really matter that much. It's kind of a small thing. I wonder if sometimes we look at church attendance that way. You know, does it really matter if I'm there, like physically there in the building? Does it really make that much of a difference? It's kind of a small thing. I'm just showing up and sitting in a pew. That's it's kind of a small thing, isn't it? Maybe sometimes we look at our family Bible study or our daily Bible reading that way. Does it really make that much of a difference that I read one chapter in the Gospel of Matthew this morning? Isn't that a small thing? Does that really matter that much? And if we're really getting honest this morning, we look at our prayers that way sometimes too. We talk about the power of prayer. We know that we're not supposed to say prayers aren't powerful. But sometimes when we look at our lives, maybe we don't say it in ourselves. Maybe we don't think it in our minds. But by our actions and how much we actually do pray, we say, ah, does prayer really matter that much? Is it really going to make that much of a difference in the lives of those that I love, those that I pray for. Sometimes we tend to see the things that God has called us to do as small and insignificant, things that don't make that much of a difference. And when we do see it that way, you know what happens? We stop contributing in that way. 
We stop doing those things, right? If Bible study really doesn't matter that much, why study my Bible? If, if, if prayer doesn't make that much of a difference, well, I'm not really going to focus on praying that much. I can spend my time doing something else. The story of Zerubbabel teaches us don't despise the small things. Don't think that the contributions you make don't matter, because they do. The Bible teaches us that all of those things that we talked about, they matter a great deal. They matter more than we think they do. The book of Philippians teaches us that our example and our attitude do matter. That's the wrong passage. One second. Uh Uh-oh, there it is. We're going to go back and fix that. All right, the book of Philippians teaches us that the small things we do are our example. Our example really does matter. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Your attitude, your example, they matter. They matter that much that they will prove you to be. A light in the world, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Your example matters, and your presence in the assembly matters. As we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day drawing near. You think you being here doesn't matter, but it does. It makes a huge impact. Not only on your spiritual state, but on my spiritual state too. It matters a great deal. It's not a small thing. You think your family Bible studies don't matter. They sure mattered for Timothy. Because Paul said this to him. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of. Knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood. You have known the sacred writings. Which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Don't think studying the Bible or talking about the Bible or praying or reading the Bible with your family is a small thing. It's not. And James teaches us that our prayers, our prayers accomplish much as well. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. There are some things in our walk with Christ that we look at and we think they're small. We think they're insignificant. We think that contribution doesn't matter much, but it matters more than we think. Don't despise. Don't despise the small things. And secondly, as you can already see, we need to make sure that we understand that we should not despise the small things because small things advance the mission. Small things advance the mission. You know, in some ways, doing the work of God is like running a relay race. We do our best to run our leg of it, and then we pass the baton to the next guy. That's exactly how it works for Zerubbabel when it comes to rebuilding Jerusalem. You know, God doesn't take him and say, okay, you're going to oversee the entire restoration of Jerusalem. He sends him back with one specific job. I want you to go rebuild my temple. That way, the people can worship me the way they're supposed to. The priests can begin serving in the way that they are supposed to serve. You are going to be, you're going to be the first domino that falls so that the rest of Jerusalem can be fixed and restored. And so Zerubbabel goes back and he rebuilds the temple. And because he does that, Ezra is able to go back and he is able to teach the people the law. So not only can they worship right, but now they know how to worship right. And then after Ezra teaches the people the law, Nehemiah goes back and he fixes, he fixes the wall. So that people can be protected and restored to some measure of prominence. Zerubbabel may look at what he's doing. He may look at that and say, that's a small thing. But at the end of the day, he needs to see that he is doing the job that God needs him to do to advance God's mission. We need to think like that too. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me go back a little bit. One second. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 17 and 18 where Paul talks about the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. I really like that line. That he has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. He put us all in our place, the place that we're meant to be in. 
Not so that we could take over all the work and do it all ourselves, but so that I could do my part in my place next to you who are doing your part in your place and next to that person who is doing their part in their place. We fill the gaps and he puts us in the gaps he needs us in so that we all can do our little part to advance the mission. I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget that we're building the kingdom together. You ever feel that way? I forget that I don't have to run every leg of the race. That what God needs me to do is just to run the portion of the race that he gave to me and pass the baton to the next person. I think we need to look at our lives that way and not get overwhelmed by all the things that are going on in the world and all the things that we wish we could change, all the things we wish we could control and influence. We need to just look at our lives and say, I'm going to do what God put in front of me so I can advance the mission. The truth is you can't teach everyone's kids, even though you want to, right? Everybody thinks they can teach everybody else's kids perfectly, right? I wish I could teach everybody's kids and then everybody would be right and we'd raise a wonderful generation. Everything would be great. You can't teach everyone's kids. But what you can do is you can teach the kids that God gave you. Or you can teach the little people that God has put close to you in your life, whether they're your kids or not. And the truth is you can't save the entire city of Temple Terrace. There's tens of thousands of people here. You're not going to be able to have a personal Bible study with every single one of them and save every single one of them. That's just not going to happen. I mean, Peter only got 3,000 on Pentecost and you don't have the Holy Spirit preaching the sermon through you, okay? So that's not going to happen. But you know what you can do? You can talk to the neighbor that God gave you. You got two of them. You can do your part in your place to advance the mission. You know, you can't change the trajectory of the country. You only get one vote. You're not the king. And so you don't get to decide how the elections go or what laws are passed or anything that's going on here. You don't get to decide what happens in our schools and what our kids are taught and what they're exposed to. You don't get to control that stuff. But you, what you can do is you can influence a brother or sister in Christ. You can correct them or teach them or encourage them like Don talked about last Sunday. You can do your part in your place to advance the mission. To be a little transparent this morning, I struggle with that as a preacher a little bit. I think every preacher does to a degree. But the truth is, as a preacher, I can't minister to every church, can I? I can't preach to a church in Iowa and Oregon and Florida all at the same time. I can't control what everyone does in every place. I can't control what everyone teaches in every place. I can't control what everyone practices in every, every place. But what I can do is I can do my job here. I can do my job to advance the mission in the place that God has put me. And I may look at that and say, well, that's a small thing. But small things advance the mission when we all do them together. I need to remember that. Now let me blaze forward and get my third point. Finally, we need to remember not to despise the small things because God does big things with small things. One verse that we passed over early in our study is Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. There the prophet says this, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. That's an important message. The message of Zerubbabel in this, in this prophecy is not, hey, keep it up because you think you're doing small things, but, but you're doing huge things. Way to go. You're so powerful. The message to Zerubbabel is keep it up. Because God is going to take your small human contributions and he's going to do big things with them. We need to remember that the success always comes from God and never from ourselves. That's why it's okay for us just to do those small things. Because God does the big things. Just fill your role and God does big things with them. That's something that I need to keep in mind. And maybe the best example of that. Maybe the best example of that is when it comes to salvation. 
the idea that God can take something small that someone does and do something big with it. You know, back in, in 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a wonderful story about a man named Naaman. I'm sure many of you have heard that story before. If you haven't heard that story before, it's an amazing story. You should read 2 Kings chapter 5 this afternoon. But Naaman was a, was a commander. He was not an Israelite. He was actually an enemy of the Israelites. But he had a terrible disease called leprosy. And he went to Israel to speak to the prophet Elisha about getting his leprosy cured. And when he came to Elisha, Elisha told him to wash in the Jordan River seven times. And he gets upset about that. He gets upset because, well, there are better rivers in Damascus where he's from. And he thinks at the end of the day, this is a ridiculous thing he's asking me to do. Just go wash in a river seven times? And he runs away and he's upset and he despises the thing that Elisha has asked him to do. But on his way leaving, his servant says to him, if the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more when he asks you, wash and be cleansed? The point of the servant is, you would have done a big thing, why won't you do a small thing? And the story of Naaman becomes a great example of, of what ultimately saves Christians. It's a type of, of how we today are saved through baptism. And it's, 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 it's a great parallel because one thing we need to understand about baptism is not that we're doing some great thing. We're not doing some big thing. What we're doing is a small thing. What we're doing is saying, I believe in Jesus and I want to seek his cleansing, his forgiveness through the waters of baptism by doing what he said. I believe, I repent, I confess his name before men, and I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to submit to baptism so that he can do something big in me. So that he can wash away my sins. Because that's what God does. He does big things with your small things. And so, if you do have a need to be saved today, if you have not been saved, if you have not done that small thing so that you could wash and be cleansed, we'd love to help you, help you with that this morning. Or if there's anything else that we can help you with, anything we can encourage you with, anything we can, we can uh, make make. Uh, clearer for you. We invite you to come to the front. We'll help you while we stand and while we sing.